was in the background. Ooh. There we go. And I believe we are live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I apologize right away for the quality of my voice because I have a cold and I feel like my head is a block of stuff that is gooey. Mm -hmm. I won't say the word because it's a <laughs> word. Yeah, we've bo both been uh, fighting off uh, a cold over the past week um, and uh, have also been um, talking all week uh, due to the uh, Lincoln conference. Mm -hmm. So our voices are a little strained. A little think. rough. <laughs> but welcome to the uh, Alliterative Endless Knot Lingfest Q&A live stream. Is that everything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say hi in the chat if you're here and you want to say hi. Um, we'll probably give it a moment for people to join in before we get really started. And I'm going to drink my ginger and lemon tea. <laughs> I know I promised cocktails, but I'm not up for cocktails right now. I have a Tom Collins, so it's a cocktail, but you know it's a tall drink. It's largely um, just soda water. So. Might be possibly because it's only 1 p.m. here, so it's a bit early for the cocktail. Soda water. High and... Swedish Finn polymath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Soda water and lemon juice, so it's probably good for my lots of vitamin C. So. <laughs> exactly. And some old Tom Jim. Of course. Our, your background really does look very cluttered. We yeah. have a lot of things in this mm -hmm. room. I'm <laughs> not used to seeing this angle of it. Um, so what we're going to be doing, we have some questions that people asked us already, and we're going to start off by answering some of those. But if you have other questions that you want to ask, pop them in the chat. If you just want to say hi, um, if you have any follow-ups to whatever we discuss, um, it, this is just... A, it's an opportunity to chat about and nerd about out about anything that we have any expertise on and some things that we don't have much expertise about. <laughs> Here, shove over a little bit because no no this this way because I think you're out of the focus area. There we go. Um so we had a good suggestion for starting off, which was from uh Rayan Khan, maybe? 343 on YouTube. Anyway, um, a question which said we should start by introducing ourselves and talking about the origins of our names, which is a good idea. So we'll start with that. So Mark, do you want to tell, say your name and explain where it's from? <laughs> well, my first name is uh, a well-known etymology. Um, so Mark from the uh, Roman name Marcus, um, which you know common wisdom um holds that it is connected to the god mars um and that seems like probably true um but the complication comes in uh you know in terms of where the god name mars comes from so we think of um mars as the uh the god of war the Roman god of war, who became um, sort of associated with the Greek Ares. But originally, uh, Mars uh, was not a god of war, it seems. Um, he may have been originally a, go a god of thunder. Um, in any case, the, uh, the name seems to come from pre-Roman, from some pre-Roman god. Um, it could be... <laughs> Uh, an, an Etruscan god. So, of course, <laughs> the Etruscans were, um, you know, uh, a powerhouse on the um, on the in the region of Italy uh, before the the rise of Roman power and Roman influence. And whenever there's a word in Latin that we don't know the origins of, or a, a word or anything to do with religion, hmm. immediately they say, "Oh, it's probably Etruscan." It's a good get out of jail free card because we don't actually know Etruscan. We haven't, we only know a few words of it and we don't know much about it and it's not Proto-Indo-European, so it's an easy out. Oh, it's probably Etruscan. Yeah, you can't go past that. <laughs> so there there was a Roman, uh, an Etruscan Thank god, you. Maris. Um, so it could be from that god. Um, as I said, originally Mars himself seems to come from an Indo-European god uh, of thunder. Um, so 
from the same god that also produced uh, Thor, uh, the the uh, the Norse god Thor. Um, and so things got kind of shifted around um, in terms of the associations and so forth. Uh, another possibility is that Mars, the name comes from the stem Mawart, uh, who, um, again, we don't really know where it comes from, uh, but there is uh, an earlier form, Mawars, uh, related to the Oscan. Oscan is another Italic language um, related to, to Latin, um, uh, so Oscan Mamers. So, I mean, we can sort of piece together what the name uh, sort of sounded like uh, what it might have been before, but it's all very uncertain. Yeah, and it's important to say also that Mars, the god, might have been a god of thunder, but also seems to have been a god of agriculture, or at least most of his early rites at Rome are actually to do with agricultural and spring planting. And that's why March, March is the god uh, Mars's month, which is a spring month. It also then becomes a, the, the thinking goes though it's not none of this is none of this is more than speculation frankly but the thinking goes that because March was also the month in which the campaigning season began that's when mm -hmm. because in the ancient world or in certainly early Rome um, fighting was a cyclical thing you did it you went in the spring you fought over the summer and you came back in time for harvest and so it's because it was the beginning of the spring campaign season. Over time, March became associated with the beginnings of going out to war, and so Mars, as the god of that time, became associated with war. And that that's the, but all of this happens before we have written records, so it's hard to tell. But there's traces definitely of him as an agricultural and fertility god in Roman ritual. So that does seem to be likely. Yeah. So the next part then is my last name. Uh, so Sundaram, it's an Indian name. Um, and it comes from um, oh, the word sunara uh, or sunaram, um, so which means glad, joyous, delightful, uh, and that d gets added in. It has nothing to do with the etymology, so sunar becomes sundar. Um, it ju it's just a, an intrusive letter, <laughs> as, as linguists <laughs> term these yeah, things. It seems it makes it sound very rude, yeah. but it's just it's for ease of speech, yeah. right? Like because it's easier to say and it makes this right. clearer, the, the syllables clearer. Uh, so this this is a, you know, from Hindi, from, from Sanskrit, this is an Indo-European root. Um, and uh, so that sun part, the first part of that word, um, comes from esu, uh, which is, uh, which means um, good. Um, and it is actually an extension of, um, an uh, even simpler, more basic Indo-European root, S, which is the verb to be. So, I mean, that's where we get the word is from. Um, so to be and then to be good um, is the sort of uh, progression of that. Uh, the second part of that word, Nara, uh, comes from the, uh, in, well, it means man. Uh, and it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root ner, meaning man, in its most ba basic sense. It probably had something like vigorous, vital, strong, the kind of qualities associated with masculinity. Um, and from that root, uh, that's related to, for instance, the andro, all those andro words. Um, uh, androgyny. androgyny. Oh, and, well, th th that's a weird one to yeah, say. It's both androcentric. Um, yeah, actually, actually, that's a good place to pause because there was a question, or was, um, Swedish Finn Polymath, who turns out his name Marcus, um, brought up, you asked about, you mentioned Alexander, and that's a good place right. to stick that in because that andair on Alexander yeah. is that word, andros, anair, andros, so in Greek, so it is, Alexander is from Greek, and, and, and the word for man that comes from this root in Greek is anair in the nominative, and the stem is and, andre. So in the um, all the other cases, it's andra, so anair andros, and that in Alexander, the alex is uh, warding off or protecting. So alexandros is the warder off, you know, the protector of men, uh, um, either a man who protects or someone who protects men. So it can work either way. Um, and so you get it 
is a very common word name in Greek. So uh, Paris, for instance, in the Trojan War, his other name, in fact, the name by which he's called most often in the Iliad is Alexandros, uh, because he's the man who, you know, protects the city. Obviously, he, it's, in that case, it's basically an ironic name, as many names in myth are, because he is the one who brings the downfall of the city. He's the destroyer of the city. Um, his birth is presaged by a dream that his mother has that she gives birth to a torch that burns down the city. So him being called Alexandros could be called a sort of an effort to, to ward off what, what his birth, the omen of his birth. So anyway, so Alexander, but we know Alexander and the reason it becomes such a hugely widespread name in the modern world is, of course, Alexander the Great, uh, who was notable as really the opposite of a protector of men. He was a destroyer of many, many men, but I suppose he may have decided that he was protecting some of them. Anyway, so that's connected to, there's the, and there, there is, same root as in Una, mm -hmm. Naras. So, uh, Su and Nair, or Sunara, uh, means literally, you know, good man. Right. So, your um, warlike good man? <laughs> I say nothing. <laughs> Hi, Arcanic. I'm like to um, All right, so that's Mark's name, and my name is Avon McMaster. I'm less visible on the... On the um, well, my head is so full the of video side of things. The video side of things, thank you. This is a bad omen. Um, though, if you listen to the podcast, you're used to me. And my name is a little bit um, odd in that my first name, Avon, is not typically a name. There are more people now with the first name Avon. It's starting to grow, but, I mean, it's extremely rare. So I'll tell you the origin of where it comes from as a name for me and then a bit about what the... In, in as much as there is a source for the name. Um, I'm named after the Mountain Avens, which is a flower that grows in the Rockies, um, elsewhere as well. But in the Rockies, my parents used to go hiking there and they liked the flower and my mom had a dream about them. Anyway, and my parents were hippies in the 70s. So they named me uh, after a flower. And so that my name is Avon without the S on the end. So that's what I'm named after. That flower is, the Latin name is the Dryas octopetala. So it's from the Dryad family, Dryas family, which is named after the Dryads from Greek myth. And the octopetala just means it has eight petals. Excuse me. As I said, vaguely. Um, the name Avens, as, it's hard to say because the name of a flower is not um, etymologized as much as some others, but uh, it's just a common name, but it probably comes from the Celtic root ab, which means water or river. So it's probably cognate, unsurprisingly, to the word Avon, like the river um, in Stratford-upon-Avon. And there's some other Celtic, there's a fair number of Celtic water words that have that ab or av prefix. There's also a word in French, aven, which is a cave formed, the kind of pothole cave that's formed by water um, seeping down and causing sort of undercutting the, the ground so that you get these sort of um, direct, uh, the kind of caves that you would drop into rather than climb into. Um, and that's an aven, and it seems to be associated with that, the Celtic word. So that's as close as I can get to an origin for that name. But my last name, McMaster, is pretty straightforward. Um, Mick is the patronymic prefix. Mick or Mac, those are just two spellings of the same one. They come from the Celtic. Uh, they come from the Celtic word ma or the root Macos, which is sun. So it's just very literally sun, and um, as in son of the father. Um, that word you see in in uh, Welsh, you get map. Uh, so you and app. So you'll find in Welsh names you'll find app or map as a, a prefix or as a separable prefix that's used to, to denote the same thing. And it performs the same, it has the same uh, function as the O in a, like O'Leary or something like that, where it is of, just from, which again is a patronymic. And there's patronymics, you get this kind of thing in, in um, what is it, uh, what's the Russian patronymic, uh, Vich, the, the suffix Vich, like 
Petrovich is just son of Peter. So that is a name that a, a name formation, a last name formation that comes from the period when people were still just saying so and so son of so and so, and then it at some point becomes fixed as a name and master. So it means son of the master, and master in that context almost certainly means teacher. Master comes from uh, the Latin magister, which is the same word that gives us magistrates. So in general, it just means bigger one, one with more power, because it's from the adjective um, from magus, which is the adjective or adverb more, the comparative form of, of um, well, of, we get magus and maxima, so that uh, the comparative and the, and the superlative. And they come from the root, the Proto-Indo-European root, meg, which just means great. So magus means bigger or greater and the or more. And magister is one with more power, one who's in front, one who's the leader. We get magistrate from it, but it also was the term that was used to mean a teacher, especially in the Middle Ages. So it becomes this sort of standard term for teacher. It's what gives us the master's degree, you know, become a master of something. Or schoolmaster. A schoolmaster, all of those. Um, the form master is somewhat influenced by maître, or what becomes the French maître, which is the same word that comes from the same root, but developed slightly differently in pronunciation, and so it then influenced the English form of the word to, to help the G drop out and have it become master. So McMaster means son of the teacher. Um, and then, so at some point in the past, some family member was a teacher, and then somebody else got that name. Um, but it, as you, I'm sure, know McMaster is a very common name, and it's all over the place. Ironically, I am the child of a teacher. My father was a teacher, a uh, college teacher, and also, ironically, also, McMaster is definitely a Scottish name. But and my father is Scottish, was born in Scotland, but his father was born in Plymouth and was English. So the McMaster actually comes from the English side of the family, while my grandmother's name is an extremely common English name, even though she was Scottish and born in Scotland. So, you know, the, uh, everyone's like, oh, McMaster, that must be because you're Scottish. And I'm like, yes, but also no, because that's not where that name came from, but that's okay. So anyway, so that's mine. Um, I'm watery child of the teacher, I guess. <laughs> A watery flower child of the teacher. Um, oh, thank you, Topher. <laughs> I very much appreciate that. That is extremely kind. Um, Mark, do you want to answer the first question? Topher has opinions on this question. While mm -hmm. I make a note of Robert's question to come back to. Right. Uh, okay. So Topher says, uh, enjoy the 12 days of Christmas videos. How does your production process differ from your short form versus long form content? Uh, so the... Um, the sh I mean, so there's the, the very technical side of the way we, we film it. The short form content is all directly to camera, um, whereas the long form content, we, we always have a little introduction directly to camera. Uh, but um, in terms of how it's produced, um, I record just an audio only um, uh, voiceover for the majority of the video um, and then animate uh, to, to pr produce the visuals. Um, whereas the, uh, the short form, since it's done directly to camera, we've experimented with a few different ways of uh, how to get that, but, um, we, uh, what we settled on is kind of the same way that we record the little intros to, um, you know, to the longer videos. So it's done to camera, uh, with uh, an iPad serving as, um, a teleprompter. And I think the other piece is that they're both scripted obviously, and we've been written before. The short ones come, we're drawing them from the um, etymologies that Mark has been doing as tweets for a few years now. So we've been drawing them. So they're already written um, there. I mean, then we just mm -hmm. put them, you know, edit them so that they're going to come in as, under a minute because right now that's the, the like limitation on a short. And then just, you know, do them straight. They are just etymologies, as you know, with very occasionally an extra fact. Those are very easy comparatively to produce, right? Mark just has to, they, they come about originally because you come up mm -hmm. mostly, you just think of one, either you see an interesting pair or you think of one word and then find some interesting 
uh, related word that is surprising and, and write it from there. Um, so we've got a whole backlog of those. The reason we started doing them is because they're very quick to do. So you, like you can, they're already written. We edit them briefly. We record in a batch and then I do them on my phone and put in the, the words, the, the actual visuals in them. I know it's extremely bare bones and not very cool, but then I'm not very cool and not very good at it. So that's as good as I can get. The contrast to that is the long videos, which uh, take a lot of work, as evidenced by the fact we did not manage a long video last year, which is a first uh, and not something we're particularly proud of. We got some in-between length ones. Yeah, yeah we no, got some no shorter longer. ones, but none of the big mm -hmm. ones, because those ones take a huge amount of research and then writing and then rewriting and editing and then finding all the images and then animating, animating them, uh, well, putting putting it into to the, the big sort of one document that has or the one thing that mm -hmm. image that has all of those images in, putting in all the writing, animating that, doing the voiceover, cutting the voiceover to editing it to... to um, the appropriate so the, uh, and all the mistakes out, then matching those editing audit <laughs> editing the videos so that it matches to the audio, and then putting that out. And that is a huge thing. And due to life, essentially, we just haven't. You haven't really got past the research. You're just into the writing finally on well, the thing you've been working on for. Yeah, about a third of the way into this to a script. Yeah, so there is a script that he's been working on um, since last. Christmas, mm -hmm. um, and that we're, we've got, you, could, you could say what it is, I think. Yeah, can, yeah, it's another in the series of cocktail uh, etymology. Yeah, so it's going to be another cocktail, but it just takes a long time to do the research, and these days, Mark finds so much interesting research that then the more interesting <laughs> research he finds, the, the longer, longer the script, yeah. the longer the script, the longer all the other pieces of the process are. Um, and so we started doing the shorts partly because YouTube is really pushing shorts, but also because it felt really bad not to be putting out material. Um, but there was really, they don't really delay the production of the longer one because Mark doesn't have to write it, research or write anything new. It just takes half an hour to do a batch of filming and then I do the production on it and I can't do anything to help him with the other video until he gets further with it anyway. So it doesn't, um, we're not, it's not that we are doing the shorts now and that's why we're not doing the longer one because we haven't got a longer one out, we're doing the shorts is the way it's working. Oh, and specifically for the 12 Days of Christmas shorts, um, though those came, they're, they're sort of excerpted and modified from uh, a, lo a, a longer video that we did ages and ages and ages ago. Um, so that's that's where those specifically come from. Yeah. And we may do some other themed ones like that around mm -hmm. other events or something if they come up. Um, next time the Olympics are up, we have a whole bunch of Olympics ones, for yeah. instance. But, but there's no Olympics right now, so we can't do those. Um, so thank you very much for your contribution and your question. Uh, Robert, I don't know the answer to that question. I dutifully just wrote it down, but I don't actually know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what the hell? Um, the Asian are Asian names like European names and having professional titles in them. Um, I don't. I, I can speak a little bit about South Asian um, traditions. I don't think. I don't know how much of a role professional names play into it, but it is a patronymic system. Um, so your last name, which is actually your first name, the family name, the family name, the family name is um, derived from your father's name. Um, and so with every generation, that family name changes. Um, it's, of course, now been interrupted in my case. So my last name is indeed from my father's given name. Um, but I have now passed down my last name to my children as their last name. So yeah, that, and your father your father really was the one who started that by, by taking, you know, westernizing his name yeah. when he immigrated to in England, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and taking the name that came second. second in the way that it was written in his own uh, culture and language and saying, okay, well, we'll just call that my second name, my last name, and then sort of the nickname or the name of his became his first name. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a name he, we knew him by, but his family still all called him by what we call his last name. Yeah. And that was his first name. <laughs> Was confusing, but now it's just been fossilized as yeah. last name. Yeah. So that won't won't happen anymore. Okay. 
So, and I, yeah, I don't know about professional names in other, in other cultures, unfortunately. No. I don't know how, how that works. If anyone in the comments does, I'd be interested to know. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> Again, apologies for the voices and the hearty amount of cold that is coming through. <laughs> Fortunately, you can't catch cold no. through. Uh, we are all still video. socially distant. Yeah. Let's take it. And it's not COVID. It's tested multiple times. It's just a cold that the entire family has had. Um, all right. Well, um, as I said, if you have any other questions, please do keep putting them in the chat. But we will go back to one of the other questions that was asked. Um, this one comes from a Patreon subscriber, Daniel Huppersberger. Daryl. Daryl, sorry. Of course, I knew that. I just can't see that far away. Um, and this is a multi-part question that I might not, I don't know, do you want to read out the whole question or do you want to just answer it and explain it? It's a question about how the early Old English and Scandinavian languages interacted and how that affected um, English's simplification of grammar, in particular with reference to gender, grammatical gender. Right. So, do you want to? So, um, well, it, um, he starts off. Um, she, she ah, uh, starts off uh, with, um, you know, kind of reviewing the sort of common um, okay. common wisdom um, uh, in terms of how grammatical gender disappeared from English, uh, basically because. Um, the uh, Old English and Old Norse are both Germanic languages, so they're fairly similar. They've got the same basic vocabulary in terms of the roots of the words, uh, but the endings are all different. Um, so they found, because of heavy Scandinavian settlement, uh, particularly in the north of uh, England, um, there was a lot of intermixing of populations, intermarriage, and so forth. And so they found it was easier to communicate if they just stopped paying attention to the endings and just used the roots of the words to communicate because those were pretty similar. Um, and therefore, the endings kind of disappeared from the language because no one was using them anymore. Um, and as a result of that, since there were no endings left, uh, there was nothing to clearly indicate grammatical gender. And so once you have nothing indicating it, you kind of forget it. Uh, and that's, that is exactly, you know, how it happened. Um, you know, it was, Old English was already, you know, gradually losing those inflections, those endings anyways. Uh, but the, um, the arrival of Norse on the scene really accelerated that process. Um, and, you know, that did lead to uh, the disappearance of grammatical gender. So that's absolutely true. Um, Daniel this, goes on to ask about um, did how much Old English and Old Norse differed in what gender various words were. Well, like, did they have different genders for the same word? Is that one of the reasons that it was conflict, or were they the same gender but different endings? Yeah, so it's it, it's the second of those. So uh, they generally agreed in gender because those words are coming from the same Proto-Germanic stock of vocabulary, um, and so unless there was something, some reason for uh, the gender of a word to flip or something as it, um, you know, developed over time, um, you know, they, they're, they, they're going to be the same gender uh, on most of the time. I'm not going to say that um, there were no differences. There probably were a few differences that crept in here and there. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, they had, this, you know, the same word had the same gender in the two languages. Uh, but what was really different is what the, the endings look like. And so just to kind of demonstrate this, uh, I'm going to tell you the forms of an Old English and Old Norse word, or the two sort of cognate words, the, the word stone, uh, which in Old English was stan, um, and in Old Norse was stain. Now, uh, in Old English, there's no ending. It's, it's just S-T-A-N. Uh, in Old Norse, in the and this is the nominative singular form, as it were, um, it's S-T-I-N, and then another N is the ending. Now, they sound pretty similar, um, so that wouldn't have caused too much difficulty. Uh, then in the accusative singular, they would have both been the same, no ending, so just stan or stain, single N there. The genitive also looks pretty similar, so in Old English, it's stanes, with an E-S ending, Whereas in Old Norse, it stains with an S ending. So 
pretty similar. Then it gets a little more different in what's called the dative singular form. So in Old English, it's stane with an e, and in Old Norse, it's steni with an i. They don't look radically different, but it is a different ending. Uh, then it gets even more different when you get to the plurals. So um, in Old English, the nominative and accusative plurals uh, ended as, stanas, um, for both the nominative and the accusative plural. And indeed, that's where our modern English um, plural s comes from. Um, it comes from this as ending, the a kind of just disappeared, and we're just left with the s in modern English. Now, in Old Norse, the nominative plural is stanar, a r, so that's quite a bit different. Uh, and then um, in uh, in Old Norse, the accusative plural has a different ending. So, you you know, as I said, it's AS for both the nominative and accusative plural in Old English. In Old Norse, the nominative um, plural and the accusative plural are, are different. Um, so, whereas it's steinar in the nominative, it's steina in the, in the sorry, the uh, accusative plural. Is everyone keeping up with this? Yeah. Without having it uh, written out in front of you, like I've got it written out and I still can't follow it. But um, obviously the important point here is that there are differences. Yeah. No quizzes. We don't have a quiz at the end. <laughs> Go on, sorry. Well, and then the rest of the plurals, they actually are the same. Uh, the ending is A for both um, Old English Old Norse, Stana and Stain A, uh, and Stanum and Stainum uh, in Norse. Right. So, I mean, and this is one of the ones where they're relatively similar, um, but you'll see that there are some key differences that could lead to confusion, especially when you get an ending that means that looks identical but means a different thing in the other language. Uh, that can cause a lot of confusion, um, and it's almost worse having the endings similar but not the same. Uh, you know, anyone who has uh, you know been trying to learn a second language can probably attest to that. Uh, you know, the, the problems when you have two things in, 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 in your two languages that are similar but not quite the same and you get them confused all the time. Um, so, and in, and that's just one example of one paradigm across all the different grammatical forms. There's all kinds of, you know, little differences and, and, and things here and there. So, you know, it, it led to, um, you know, confusion and so hence uh, the, the dropping of those endings and the loss of grammatical gender. Um, and once you drop the endings, you know, there isn't an easy way to tell gender unless you include an, another word that agrees with the noun. So originally you would have the definite article uh, or you would have an well, article of an some, article sort. Of some yeah. sort um, that would have endings that could tell you, you know, what form of the noun uh, you're dealing with. Um, though in um, in Old English, originally you didn't have to include an article, it was optional. And in fact, what becomes modern English's definite article, the, um, originally meant it had a little more force than that. It meant really that. Um, and so you don't go around saying that stone all the time, right? You, you, you know, unless you're trying to call attention to it, you just say the stone, um, sistan. Um, so, you know, it wasn't required early on in Old English. It gradually becomes required as Old English becomes early Middle English, and it becomes more like our, our definite article. Um, but by that point, the definite article forms were becoming less and less distinct until the point where now you use the for everything, right? Yeah. You use just the one form and it doesn't tell you anything. So you can't rely on that for help. Yeah, and, and once you start to substantially not have indicators of what gender things are, then you aren't, you know, your next generation isn't learning them as gendered nouns. Mm -hmm. And once you aren't learning them as gendered nouns, they no longer have gender. Okay. <laughs> so because it, it only has gender as long as there's a need to, as long as there's a requirement in the language to indicate it, that gender. So as soon as that's gone, it's gone. Uh, and just as a little uh, footnote to that, you use the example milk. Those happen to both be feminine. I checked just to, just to see. So yeah, Old English milk and uh, Old Norse um, yolk. Um, so uh, they're both feminine um, forms in, in the languages. And then another question was, did Old English and Old Norse have two grammatical genders or three like modern German does today? So the so Proto-Germanic had three, uh, masculine, feminine, uh, and neuter. Um, all, 
English, you know, and so those three, uh, uh, you know, survived into Old English, and eventually, by modern English, uh, grammatical is, gender is lost completely. Um, in Swedish and Danish, so Old Norse had the three, had all three, um, like modern German. Um, but in Sweden and Danish, the masculine and feminine uh, genders merged into what's called the common gender. So that's the gender for human beings, for living. It's sort of animate, inanimate in a sense. Um, so masculine, feminine uh, merged into common gender, but they kept the neuter. And so uh, Swedish and Danish have two genders. Um, and modern Icelandic uh, preserves the three. Um, masculine, feminine, and neuter, right? And then um, did the influence of French on English, in Middle English, did that affect genders? Um, yeah. yeah. Did Middle English have grammatical gender? Yeah, so that certainly was, um, you know, helpful that it was already on the way out by the time French started to have um, an influence that that system of grammatical gender was already beginning to break down, and so yeah, that made it that made it easy for the French words just to come in, and then you don't have to think about grammatical gender because they weren't really paying that close attention to it anymore, anyway. And by that point, English and French do differ on the gender of most nouns. They do. Oh, not most, not most, but many, many. Many. Like there's no there's no particular pattern to which ones have what gender. Like yeah. I, there is no. There's, there's no real common reason that they would have the same gender, so they do or don't in a kind of random way. So that would have just hastened that. Like sun process. and moon in in um, in French, uh, le soleil is masculine, la lune is feminine, um, but it's the reverse in Old English. Mm -hmm. in, in Old English, sun is uh, feminine and moon is masculine. Yeah, so, so that would have happened. And so they basically... I mean, there were genders in early Middle English, but not by late Middle English. Basically, like that was the, that was the end of it. Yeah, yeah. So that so those three genders just survive into Middle English, into early Middle English. You can still see, um, you know, text preserving that. But um, there are, at that point, there's very few places where um, you know it's really distinctly shown, and so it disappears pretty quickly after that. So by the time you get uh, any significant amount of Middle English being written. It sort of reemerges as a literary language um, in, you know, in the 14th century. By then, you know, the grammatical gender is, is gone. Um, so we've got... Except, of course, in uh, pronouns. Except in pronouns, yeah. yeah. Uh, but for nouns. Um, and, well, it, it essentially, it, I shouldn't say it, it, what happens is, Grammatical gender gives way to natural gender. Is right. really what happens there. Right, because we still have actor, actress, and yeah. you know things like that. So nouns, nouns can be gendered by changing their endings. Director, directrix. I mean, we, we <laughs> not that that's a very common one, but there are these different ways. Um, but only when there's we only do that now when we're matching up the natural gender of the person mm -hmm. described. As opposed to grammatical gender, which doesn't, which obviously since it applies to inanimate things, is not about um, genitalia. <laughs> Actually, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, I wanted to just say to Topher has opinions. Uh, just for the record, we prefer the long. I mean, the short stuff is fine too. We are not in any way stopping doing the longer form stuff. We do want to do more of it. We would like to get this one done and then like get another one done this year. Yep. You know. We uh, we enjoy it as well. That is the core of what we want to be doing. Um, the other place, of course, if you're interested in podcasts, if you don't already listen to our podcast, not that it's the same, but it is long. <laughs> so if you want long form stuff, it's an hour to an hour and a half usually. But the, no, there definitely will be um, some more longer videos coming out this year. So um, one hopefully fairly soon, as I say, I'm well well on the way to writing that script. So. Um, and then there's another question. Do you have an opinion on if English had developed differently if the Normans hadn't won in 1066? And maybe I guess what it might have done. That's a bit of a big what if. But. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's hard to say. I don't think it would have made uh, an enormous amount of historical difference. It would obviously be a huge linguistic difference. Um, so the language would have 
you know, been more like the other Germanic languages. It would have been, you know, fairly close to languages like Dutch. Dutch, Dutch, is, Dutch and Frisian, right, are the, mm -hmm. the closest ones on the continent. Yeah, I mean, the huge amount of vocabulary that came from French is the biggest thing mm -hmm. that would have been different. It was already losing its gender. It was already becoming um, all about syntax rather than mm -hmm. word ending. So that probably, I mean, it might have been, it was accelerated, but it would have, I'm sure, gone that direction anyway. But what would have been mainly different, so syntax wouldn't have changed all that much. No, no. It, 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 yeah, I mean, what, the changes that were happening in the syntax were already happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the contact with Latin and other those, you know, yeah. those other languages would have continued to sort of have that effect that kind of, you know, people would have still tried to write like Cicero sometimes in English and that would have affected the way we use clauses and, and that kind of, you know, um, the uh, the amount of embedded clauses and relative clauses and dependent clauses in general that English uses now is a lot more than they did in the past. But I think that comes more out of classical attempts to write like classical writers yeah. than it does out of French, yeah. specifically. And in French, it also comes out of trying to be like classical writers. So I think that probably still would have happened. Mm -hmm. But the vocabulary, obviously, we would still have picked up Latin. It were so, and we would continue to do so, but not in the, anything like the rate, right? Like many, many synonyms we have for things where we have a French version and an English version, we wouldn't have that French version. So, yeah, it would be the vocabulary. Yeah. Um, Ivan points out that it's not just humans, of course, that we still gender, but animals where it's relevant, like lion and lioness, or yeah. mare and stallion, or whatever. Um, that one's not, of course, endings. That's a simple, different word. But yeah, we. It, but it's still natural gender in the sense that if we feel like there's actually a meaningful difference in the gender of the of and that that matters, we'll use an ending to to denote that, or at least did. Um, we don't have stone and stonette, right? Because we don't care that the stone <laughs> is feminine or masculine, because we do not think of stones as feminine or masculine. So yeah. Um. No, the chimp, uh, maybe somewhat like modern Scots. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good good comparison, actually, because um, modern Scots is not derived from English. Modern Scots comes from Old English, and it, it you know, divided off early. very early. Now, it still has a lot of French influence. It does still have French influence. But that's because of specific historic connections, not, not conquest, but mm. uh, strong historic connections between Scotland and France. Um, due to complicated anti-English sentiment, mostly. <laughs> That's why, like, Mary, Queen of Scots and the French were very connected and things like that. But Scots but does preserve... Not nearly as much as English does. Yeah. yeah. But Scots does preserve a bunch of Old English um, vocabulary mm -hmm. that has disappeared from English. Right. Um, so, yeah, looking at modern Scots is, is probably a really good place to, to see, get a bit of a glimpse at what it might be like a bit. And just to be clear, I know you know that, but Scots not Gaelic, which is separate, it's a Celtic language. So modern Scots is also not just Scots dialect of English, which there is also a Scottish dialect of English. Yeah, there's Scottish English, there's Scots, and there's Gaelic. Yeah, those are three separate things. So mm -hmm. um, it's a little complicated. Um, are there books on language that you would suggest to read? This actually matches up with another question we, we, we had asked about um, what what resources um well i'm just trying to find the person who actually asked it um yeah jacob pikarski um asked uh if we could share some of the tools that we found useful and trustworthy when when we're asking about like is this word related to that word for instance so in terms of reference um uh reference sources um you know the big one is of course the oxford english dictionary uh so it's available online by subscription yeah um, okay. You have to pay, or uh, many um, public libraries have yeah. access to it. Um, most university libraries have access to most. it. Most. <laughs> Not ours. It does still. Oh, I, does? I, I okay. fought and won that one. But, okay. um, <laughs> they almost did. Uh, so, you know, you can access that. That's the, that's the sort of prime um, one to look at. Another online one is the American Heritage Dictionary. So the... Um, the link for that is ahdictionary.com. Um, 
And it's particularly useful because it has an appendix with the Proto-Indo-European roots in it. Um, and so if you really want to, you know, dig deep in, in etymology, that's a, you know, a, a useful thing. <coughs> and there is a book version of that, that appendix. Uh, this is, in fact, expanded from that uh, American Heritage uh, Dictionary appendix. So there's more in here than is on the than is in the online version or the version that you get in a American Heritage Dictionary. So that's the American Heritage Dictionary of Indo-European Roots. roots. By it's Thomas a very Watkins. very basic title. So for for English etymology for English um, you know for the Proto-Indo-European roots for English words anyways this is uh, you know kind of the best place to turn. There are of course more complete um, dictionaries for Indo-European, um, but they're, uh, you know, they're big and very technical. Mm -hmm. um, and well, the standard one is written in German. Um, so uh, Corny um, is the state still. Pick Corny. Pick Corny is that one. Um, two things. Uh, one, I think the original question was also partly about like when learning multiple languages. Hmm. If you want to say, like, is this Spanish word related to that French right. word? Do you have a good way of doing that kind of work? Especially, I guess, within European languages, because that's, you know, we know much more about European languages than non-European languages. So. This is one that I picked up that does a good job of that. Um, so it's Indo-European Cognate Dictionary uh, by Fiona McPherson. Um, and so what it has is it's got I uh, indexes of whole bunch of different um, languages in the Indo-European family. And so you can look up, you know, whatever word you want um, uh, in, in one language, and then it will refer you to what the uh, Indo-European root is. And then when you look up the Indo-European root, it then gives you root by language, all the words that come from that root. So, oh, that's really cool. So that does exactly what you're asking for. Um, so it's a really, it's a good one for that. Um, across across cross language yeah for Indo European language for Indo um, we don't have a lot of suggestions for your you know is Hungarian this related to Finnish that that one we're, you're on your own for sorry <laughs> um, then but I think Robert um, I, I don't know what what specifically you're looking for those are reference works in terms of books on language there's been a bunch coming out recently that you might want to find like friends and things. Well, one in particular, uh, we um, interviewed the author recently uh, on the podcast. Um, Paul Anthony Jones uh, put out a book that covers like all the kind of basic questions that you might have about linguistics and language. Uh, and it is called Why, why, is, this why a is This question? a Question? Why is this a yeah. question? And it's uh, the question is about English you never thought to ask sort of idea. And uh, Paul Anthony Jones is the guy who does Haggard Hawks on Twitter and elsewhere, if you don't, if you know him. And um, so that's a fun, it's a fun, it, it, it goes into enough depth that if you do already know some basic stuff, you're still going to learn things. We learned things from it. But at the same time, it's written very much for a non-specialist. So if you are just interested in language, but don't know that much about you know terminology and things, uh, it's really good. So that definitely recommend. Yeah, I would recommend that if if you want a general, you know, mm -hmm. um, book about language and, you know, not specifically focusing on one particular area, if you want something general about language, that's an excellent starting place. So, yeah, um, I mean, there's lots of other just books about language that are great. Uh, David Crystal has good books. Yeah, um, I think by David Crystal. Um, there's a book that we I, I was recently re reminded of that's about very specifically about internet language because internet by Gretchen McCullough is a favorite of ours. Um, it's about sort of what the internet has and hasn't done to the English language and how communication on the internet is different than it is in other fora. Um, there's work works by I'm just trying to think of people we've talked to recently about language. Um, oh, well, Grace Tierney has some Grace books Tierney on etymology. Books. She has a book, yeah. Words the Viking gave, Vikings Gave Us, Words the Sea Gave Us. She's working on more. So those are some good books. Um, I don't know, some of the other sort of more textbooky ones, if you want. Uh, well, if, you're, uh, if you want a book specifically about 
etymology, uh, there's a book by um, Anatoly Lieberman uh, called <laughs> called Word Origins and How We Know Them. I think okay, that's the title. Yeah. Um, and so it sort of explains well how how do people do um, etymology? Uh, so it's um, it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And there's a recommendation in the chat. Uh, Erica Ockrit's book. Yeah. Highly uh, Irregular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're also just about to do an interview with a book that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, with No, we're going to do the interview with the author. The book is about to come out soon in April. A book um, called Like Literally Dude, which is with a sociolinguist about the kinds of things people live to. What we could... What we can learn, or the, I think the subtitle is something like uh, the good that can come from bad English or something like that. Um, and it's about the sorts of things that tend to be stigmatized as bad English and what they, what they, why they exist and what they, where they come from. I haven't actually read past the introduction yet because we're interviewing her on Thursday and I haven't had, I just got the PDF yesterday. So I can't tell you much more than that, but it looks good so far. And so keep your, you know, stay tuned. That will come. The book will come out at the end of April, but our interview will come out in May. So if you're interested in that. Um, some more questions in the chat. Uh, one, it's a more technical one about the word child, hmm. where it came from. So Scots is bairn, which yeah. is the Germanic word, where does, or a Germanic word. Child is also Germanic. So it, um, is it related to kind, in, like kind, kind there? I don't know about that, but. Top of my head, I don't know. Okay, he'll look that up while I see what else there is in the chat. Um, Unicorn Danny, yeah. Um, as Ivan says, Latin had three genders. Um, and that's why basically all the Romance languages have some variety of um, genders. They've mostly simplified down to two, but not all of them. And that's the basic thing. You know, everything was every single noun had to have a gender. Um, there are a few common gender nouns and a few exceptions that work in strange ways, but every noun had a gender. Gender simply meant what kind of ending it took, what kind of system of ending. So, Germanic languages also had that. Proto Indo European had at least three genders. The yeah, discussion about what the genders were. Um, and so that's what you get. And some languages drop them and some of them don't. Yes, arcanics. Um, I agree entirely. It's a, it's a, it's a, like it's a charming. <laughs> sounds a little. I'm not sure. Charming sounds like the biggest compliment, but I do mean it that way. Like it's a, it's a well-written, interesting, amusing book. Um, so and it's an easy read. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So uh, interestingly, uh, child. We don't know where it comes from. It's it's in Old English, but we don't. There's no other cognate in any other Germanic language. We can sort of recreate what we think it would have looked like in Proto-Germanic, um, but there's no clear related word to it. So a bit of a mystery. So good question. So not related to Kind. Right. Um, Wood Perfect by Susie Dent. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Susie Dent's books are always fun. Um, she has uh, she has books uh, a little older. Some of her books are she has books about the like um, I'm not sure what it's called, but it's books about Trade words, words that are specific to certain in-groups, especially certain professional groups, like the words that London cabbies were use and the words that should build, um, you know, the army uses and things like that. So she's fun. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, words about language are a big, a, a big category. Uh, there's a lot of them are more sort of like here's a list of like Paul Anthony Jones has a bunch of here's a list of interesting words and where they come from and why they're interesting or here's a list of just funny words he has, he, he specializes in uh, weird often obsolete words and that sound funny or are interesting but there's also lots of words about, and then there's the kinds of books about like how language works and yeah. why it works the way it does yeah um, no, oh, shush. Spam text. Okay. Um, so the other questions, if there are some questions. So that was tools. Oh, the other thing that I should just say is if you go to our website, alliterative.net, there is a page of, um, I think it's called Sources and Credit. And on that, there's a, a link to general linguistic sources. And if you go there, it has 
like all of the reference works that you've mentioned mm-hmm. are on there. Is that one listed yeah. on there? Uh, Maybe not that you one. You should add that one because I think yeah. that's a useful one. Um, but list the, the general sources that Marx uses for the sort of etymological side most of the time. So there's a big long list, both of online and books and articles and things like that that he uses on a regular basis. So that's always a good place to start. Um, all right, Arcanix 1971, you asked a question um, in a YouTube mm-hmm. comment that uh, just as a sort of discussion question, so I'm gonna put it to Mark. Uh, you can only choose one area of linguistics to study or discuss for the rest of your life and your choices are either morphology or semantics. Which would you choose and why? I mean, probably semantics, um, just because it kind of goes on forever. <laughs> um, Morphology can be interesting. I, you know, it's funny because my opinions of these have changed over the years. When I was a grad student, uh, probably the one I was least interested in was um, the, the phonology side. Um, and, and yet now looking at sound changes is one of my most favorite uh, areas of linguistics. So, um, you know, these things can change, but probably, probably semantics. I mean, in fact, I've done way more with um, syntax than, you know, in terms of professional work mm-hmm. uh, than I have with any of these. I mean, that's really what my uh, you know, graduate work was focused on mostly. Um, and so, uh, but that, I would say probably semantics. There's a lot of different ways to approach semantics and a lot of different, um, you know, kind of theoretical ways of thinking about it. So. And your interests in um, cognitive linguistics cognitive would linguistics. fit best with semantic yeah. in general, um, you know, interest in semantic fields. And, mm-hmm. and while etymology is lots about sound, sound changes and morphology, there's also, you know, you spend a lot of time on semantic changes and mm-hmm. semantic developments, especially in the videos. Yeah. So I'm not going to answer the question because I'm not a linguist. So I don't feel I have to. And also, it would have to be semantics because I know so little about morphology. So it's sort of a simple question for me. Um, yeah. Um, there was another question that we don't have um, an answer to. So I'm just going to quickly say it was from Trig. Uh, was about, it was about ASL. And was Stoko really the first person to recognize ASL as a distinct language? I mean, the only kind of answer that I can give is that um, you know, it, it depends what, what you mean, you know, the first person to, to recognize it because, um, there was, um, I the exact name of it, but there was, a uh, uh, assigned language used by, um, indigenous people in North America, um, that was not only useful, you know, for people who, uh, were hearing impaired, uh, but uh, was used as a lingua franca between mm. people who spoke different languages but could use the same signed language. So obviously they had some sense that it was, you know, its own thing. Um, and that must have been, you know, long before um, Europeans were in North America. So yeah, but I mean, so that's the, the question was ASL about ASL. Specifically, I don't know. But. In terms of were there people before who recognized signed languages as signed languages? That's, that's, a, that's yeah. a different question. And really, the short answer is neither of us know very much about signed languages, so we would have just Googled it and mm-hmm. no, we wouldn't have come up with anything better than you can get through Googling. Sorry. Um, now, this question in the chat about whether either of us has ever been involved in a language maintenance or revival project. And again, no. the short answer is no. Um, I'm aware of and sort of know of people around us doing that. So we live in Northern Ontario and the local indigenous language is Anishinaabe here. And there is Anishinaabe language teaching going on at the university that I used to work at and the Mark still works at, though not as much teaching as they used to be because they fired that set of teachers. So, um, but I believe there is still some language teaching that's going on there. And that is, a, it's a maintenance that, that that language never disappeared, but it's, it's not a revival, it's a language maintenance, but it is also, a, you know, an attempt to strengthen uh, because of course um, of the intense efforts put in by the Canadian government to make the language disappear. So that is one that is going on around us. And for instance, we have a colleague who worked on an Anishinaabek uh, dictionary mm-hmm. um, that is, 
very important for that kind of work. Um, we did mean to have her on the podcast before our university imploded and she retired and I'm not sure how easy it would be to do now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, well, don't worry, Lewis. It wasn't only, or Louis, I'm sorry, I don't know which. Um, it was not only the linguistics department, it was all of the humanities. And in fact, it wasn't the linguistics department. That didn't even exist didn't already. Exist. It was but the entire the, modern languages department gone. Yeah, but it was also the indigenous studies, the indigenous all of the indigenous studies, studies programs, gone. which is what it was taught under. Um, that was canned as well as classics, which is mine, which is why I lost my job and uh, women's studies and uh, whole slew of religious whole studies department. and philosophy yeah. and um, <laughs> what else? Um, oh, also math and physics, because we're an engineering school. So why would you need a math and a physics department? Um, the physics department had recently produced a Nobel Prize winner the year before, or a Nobel Prize had been awarded to somebody who taught there. But, you know, anyway, um, <laughs> not that that's something we're a little bitter about or anything. <laughs> Look up Laurentian University if you'd like to hear the whole sordid story. They declared insolvency and canned 110 full-time faculty and cut 69 programs. So, anyway, it was fun. Um, you'd think, I, so I, I said at the time, oh, well, maybe this will mean that I have more time to devote to this project. And then we immediately ceased to put anything out. <laughs> so turns out, no, looking for an entire new job and career um, takes up some time, both actual and emotional time. And that kind of derailed me a bit. <laughs> so. But in terms of um, language revival and maintenance, um, we did do a podcast episode uh, oh, yeah. uh, that focused on um, scripts, on mm -hmm. alphabets, on the, the maintenance um, uh, and revival of, uh, of you know, endangered uh, writing systems. Mm -hmm. That was fairly recently. So if you're interested in, in that uh, and you haven't heard that episode, I think it's two episodes ago, three episodes ago, something like that, mm -hmm. um, on endangered, al and endangered alphabets. And uh, that was really interesting. So no, we haven't either of us worked specifically in done that work, but of course we're we know of and are connected to other people. We also just recently um, were on a panel. Well, at Lincom, uh, which this is in connection with at Lincom, we were on a panel with uh, someone who's done a podcast called Tongue Unbroken, which is about language in uh, Alaska, Alaskan languages, indigenous languages and um, lots of different elements of the sort of political and linguistic and social world of, of uh, Alaskan indigenous languages. Um, the last episode, which is the only one I managed to listen to so far, but um, is about the fight to get indigenous languages of Alaska declared official languages of Alaska, which they won. But it's a really interesting sort of first person narration with the host and two other people who were involved in getting, getting the bill passed. Um, about the sort of process of doing it, and it was totally fascinating. So, anyway, that's um, just again I'm, when we we're hoping maybe to have him on. I don't know the podcast. We have so many people we want to interview on the podcast, and we only really have this ability to put out one episode a, a month. And we also want to do other things that aren't interviews, and so we just have this ever-growing list of people, <laughs> and not enough time to do it. If if I had the money to pay somebody to edit them we would just be interviewing someone every week as far as I'm concerned until we ran out of these fascinating people we know, but not that yet. Excuse me. <laughs> so yeah, so we haven't, um, we haven't worked on um, language revival or maintenance, but we're interested right. in the topic. Um, and, you know, we're always uh, game to house pro it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, we're always game to, to talk about it on the mm -hmm. podcast with experts who do that work. Yeah, because it's it's something that we can't you can't just get into on a whim. You really mm -hmm. have to be connected to communities who are doing it before you, you make any effort. Um, all right, one more question that we had from before. I will just go with this one. It was exciting because it isn't. It, it, it's something that I'm. Well, I did the answer to. I was going to say that I know about. My answer is mostly going to be, I don't actually know about it, but it was from Tim Hammack, who's on Patreon, um, who said, I recently read that the Romans knew of Shiva and equated Shiva with Dionys Dionysus, 
Um, I assume this happened before Constantine. So do we know if they knew of any of the other pantheon? Um, do they know, uh, were there connections with the sort of farther east than Parthia? Um, basically what, what from the Far East did or did not influence the ancient world linguistically or otherwise. And this is not something I know a lot about, um, but that connection between Shiva and Dionysus, as far as I can tell, I, it was a reasonably quick research. Did, um, I didn't go really, really in depth to it. As far as I can tell, that connection was not made in the ancient world, or at least not by the sources we have. We have a few sources. So, the obvious thing is Dionysus was said to have visited India. So in his myth, he was said to have visited and conquered India. So that's in the Greek, you know, early Greek sources we have. What they mean by India, what they mean by Dionysus visited it, it's all left sort of. All that means is he comes back with panthers and leopards in his retinue and he's exotic, right? So, it, and it was... It used to be said, oh, that means that Dionysus comes from the East, and the the Greeks always sort of talked about him as this foreign god. But in fact, we have his name in Linear B tablets from the Mycenaean period as a clearly connected to making offerings. So he's clearly as old as any of the other Greek deities that we have evidence for. That doesn't mean he didn't come from the East originally, but I mean, as Aphrodite seems to have, but certainly he's not a newer or more in recently introduced foreign god. That said, the connection between him and Shiva, which there is scholarly discussion of that, but doesn't seem to have been done in the ancient world. And um, the uh, so there's one so there's one author in 1979 wrote this book Shiva and Dionysus in uh, French Alain Daniel uh, Danielou and I he seems to be referred to all the time so there's like I found a website that sort of uh, goes over the evidence for this connection it's called Dionysus and Shiva dot wordpress dot com um, and it has it good good citations. So there's lots of parallels. They both are associated with wild animals and spotted animals. They both are associated with the lingam or phallus as the prominent element of the worship of both um, deities, um, certain kinds of ecstatic and orgiastic celebrations, uh, connections to fertility, other elements of their story that are that have connections. So it may well be that they're connected, but probably if so, more from, you know, Indo-European and larger trends or, you know, they, they're parallel or maybe they're from the same source a long time ago. But that does not seem to have been recognized in the ancient world. We have one author in the ancient world in the Roman period who's a Greek who says that there was a connection between Dionysus and an Indian god of Nisa, because that's what Dionysus means. It means god of Nisa. Nisa was the name, in myth was the name of the... Um, a mountain that he was sheltered in as a baby, but that mountain is located in a hundred different places. Like every different place says, Oh, this is Mount Nysa, or says, But Mount Nysa always means it's always outside of wherever you are. So, wherever you are, Mount Nysa is far away. And so, at a certain point, it starts getting located in India, but that doesn't connect him to, Shiv, to Shiva particularly. So, there doesn't seem to be uh, an ancient recognition of that particular connection. If there is a connection, it wasn't recognized. In, the Asian world. in terms of other, I also couldn't find any particular evidence that the Romans knew of other Hindu gods um, in the Hindu pantheon, but that's not to say they didn't, because there certainly was contact between the Indian world and the Indian subcontinent and the Roman world. Um, and in fact, there had been com contact, of course, in the Greek East between the, uh, northern India and Pakistan. And Alexander had, you know, conquered that part of the Persian Empire and had, con had contact. And there's this area that's known as Gandahar, which was a Greco-Bactrian and Greco-Parthian and Gre Indo-Parthian series of kingdoms, where there's something called Greco-Buddhism, which is a sort of, it's the place where the first images of the Buddha come from, the first time that the Buddha is represented sculpturally, because of the, tr the Greek tradition of representing gods culturally 
which was not at that point an Indian tradition, uh, I gather from the um, from the sources. So, if they knew of Indian gods and pantheon, it would be Buddhist rather than Hindu. It seems most likely because most of the connections seem to have been other uh, connections seem to have been with Buddhist groups. Um, there are various evidences of contact. We know that Augustus apparently received ambassadors from some kingdoms in northern England, uh, England, India, and also from Tamil areas of southern India. Um, there's evidence that Claudius was in contact with the Sri Lankan court. And there's definite evidence, both historical and lots of archaeological evidence, that there was both direct and indirect trading between India and Rome. So direct, like Roman merchants actually sailing to Sri Lanka and to other places like that, um, and to other parts of the in India. Not always the parts that are closest, because it has to do with the wind and currents, what was easiest to reach. So in fact, it was easier to reach southern India in some ways than it was to reach northern India, just because of things I don't understand about the ocean. Um, but there was connection, and there seems... Some people suggest that there were, in fact, groups of Buddhists living in Alexandria around the beginning of the Roman Empire. So if there was influence from India on a language, so I don't know of any particular linguistic influence on Latin. I, there may be, but I, can't, I couldn't find anything. If there was cultural influence, probably Buddhism, not Hinduism. And there are arguments that the stories of the birth of the Buddha influence the stories of the birth of Jesus. Now, that is a fairly controversial point, but it is not impossible because of these points of contact. Um, that, and Alexandria as one of the places where sort of early Christianity was forming its stories, certainly is a place that there could have been contact because Alexandria was a big trading hub. So that's a lot of I'm not sure, but it is really interesting. I mean, there are there are caches of Roman coins that have been found in various places in India. There's Indian materials, certainly, that make it to Rome and, and well past Rome as well. Of course, pearls and silk and spices being the most important trade items. So that's that's everything I can say about that. And Louis or Louis, sorry. Um, if you are interested in that, I will write. I will just check his name and I will write. Well, it's the Unbroken Tongue is, sorry, Tongue Unbroken is the podcast. If you look that up, you'll be able to find the name of the person if you're interested in finding more of that. All right. I think that was all of our previous questions that we were asked ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So are there any other questions or comments or discussion anybody else wants to um, contribute and chat about? I'm going to let Mark talk for a minute because I'm, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> And again, uh, apologies for not having done a live stream, a live stream in so long. It, um, uh, we quite enjoyed the last time we we did one. Um, and we just never got around to to doing one again. So, and we meant to do one to celebrate because we've been marking sort of numbers of subscribers on the videos, mm -hmm. um, and we hit forty thousand, and we meant to do one for forty thousand, and then didn't. So I guess this is also a celebration of hitting forty thousand <laughs> subscribers. Um, there's a lot of things we've been meaning to do and haven't in the last couple of years, and all I can all I can do to excuse us is to point to the general state of the world and also to the specific uh, transitions that we've been going through ourselves. It's been a, a up and down kind of last little while. I now have a nine to five job, for instance, which is a whole new thing I have to figure out how to deal with, which I'm sure is not. Does not make anybody else who has a nine to five job feel very sorry for me, but just a different rhythm. Oh, with Jackson Crawford. Yeah, that would be fun. That would definitely be fun. We've talked about it. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about having him on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that would probably be the way to, if we did that, then once we made that connection, we could. Yep. Yeah. We've been a little reluctant to try to do, given how terribly we've been doing at keeping up with our own videos, we've been reluctant to propose 
collabs because we don't want to, you know, disappoint somebody else by not following through. So we sort of wanted to be a little more back on a level, um, getting things done better. Basically, we wanted to be doing, be more productive before we collabed. But uh, yeah, so well, I'll make sure he's on our list. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the next two months, three months sorted. But after that, it's open. Oh, so. Then a podcast. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Louie. Um, so, Seymour cut the bread with a knife and Seymour used the knife to cut the bread. Are we familiar with that debate? I don't know the debate. I mean, is is it between which of those is clearer? I mean, those are just two ways of saying the same thing. So I don't think I know that the specific debate you're referencing. Hmm. Thanks, Organics. <laughs> I really appreciate you being hanging here and hanging out. Um, we Oh, have fun at playing chess. <laughs> Yeah, we will probably be ending fairly soon just because I am losing my ability to speak. And we've been going for more than an hour. But <laughs> we don't want to head out before people are done. I don't know if anyone here who's still here was at Lingcom or went to any of that. I don't know if that's something that other people, I mean, you have to be doing linguistics communication for it to be interesting. But if there was anyone who was there, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we had a really good time hanging out with other linguistics communicators and finding out what sorts of things people are trying to do and in what venues and using what platforms and with what purposes. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, whether the underlying form oh, <laughs> are the same. Um, I mean, you know, I guess that comes down to a kind of Chomskyan uh, question, you know, <laughs> uh, how much of language is sort of underlying structures and how much of it, I, you know, I kind of am more on the behavioralist side of things. Um, and I think even Chomsky himself is not so um, committed to, um, you know, deep structures and categories anymore <laughs> either. So uh, it's just the hardline Chomskyists. Uh, who are more high, uh, hard line than Chomsky himself, who would, you know, see these things as the same structure, I guess. Well, because, I mean, they're both, they're, the question is, you're, I mean, both of them are, are doing an, an, an ablet of a means or a date of a means mm -hmm. or whatever, like they're doing, it's, the knife is the means mm -hmm. by which the thing is done. Doesn't matter whether you say, but technically, Seymour cut the bread with the knife, you've got it. Mm -hmm. What would be in Latin an ablative? I mean, that doesn't mean it is an ablative in English, but it's sort of an ablative use. Um, whereas uh, in he Seymour used the knife to cut the bread. You've got technically it's a it's an accusative, right? He used the knife, and mm -hmm. so but they're both doing the same thing in the sentence. So the end result is that the knife is the um, the means by which the thing is done. So it doesn't matter if it's an ablative of means or an accusative in a ver in a verbal phrase. Are they really equivalent or not as a structure? And that sounds like the sort of thing that true linguists discuss, and I don't. So <laughs> I'll leave it to, to Mark. Um, but yeah. So I think that's, yeah, that's a, those are the kinds of things that they're, they're like the numbers of angels that can dance on the pin of a pin of a head, head of a pin. Um, questions that can be entertaining, but don't necessarily get you much further in your understanding. Do you miss modal particles in English? I mean, we still have modals. By modal particles, what are you specifically referring to? <laughs> Can't miss them if you don't have. If you never had them, <laughs> I I know of modal particles. Uh, if if it's the same thing as they're thinking of, I know of them in Greek. Greek, Greek yeah. is where they have particles at the wahoo, um, with a lot of mo and that is what they are. They express they're, modality. They express yeah. modality. Um, and boy, oh boy, I mean, well, I was gonna say I don't 
miss them because they're so annoying, but that's actually probably not true. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so that's basically yeah. the same thing. Yeah. yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, we've got all kinds of, you know, little ways, um, different language. So, I guess it depends on, uh, you know, it is that question, what is the connection between what you see on the surface level and what you see um, going on below the surface? Uh, you know, English has lots of ways to um, ex express modality. Express modality. Um, you know, we don't use the same particles um, in the way that that uh, German does. Mm -hmm. um, well, and and it it is true that a certain number of the ways that English does it are um, disfavored in standard English. Yeah. So that there's a lot of the mm -hmm. modality that we're actually quite good at expressing in spoken English and in dialects of English that aren't really necessarily that dialectal, but um, dialectical. No, that's a word in philosophy. I don't know. I'm losing my ability to dialect. I'm, yeah, I'm dialect. losing my ability to language here. Um, the so you know, like like like, for instance, mm -hmm. which is one of those things we use to express certain kinds of modality all the time, uh, but is not considered or you know, you or, know, yeah. So, uh, and I think those are used functionally like particles, really, because mm -hmm. um, they obviously don't have the lexical mm -hmm. meaning that they theoretically would yeah but but that's what i mean that but they're you know mm -hmm. they're dispreferred in formal writing. formal writing but also even in formal speech to the extent mm -hmm. that people you know that this book that's coming out that we're going to be interviewing her about is all about people's dislike of such things and other things like non-standard verb formations like i'm gonna be doing or something you know mm -hmm. i'm a, i'm a gonna or i'm i'm gonna do something mean something different than I'm going to or whatever, right? Like there's a lot of um like the Irish he's after coming to dinner, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean the same as he is coming to dinner. Those are two different things, but one of those is, you know, a dialect. But really what it is doing is expressing a certain kind of modality. So I think there's a lot of what are seen as informal in English. And what I don't know, because I don't know German well enough, is to what extent things like the and Yaneben and stuff like that are verbal but not, you know, discouraged in formal written or to what extent they are considered part of formal language. So, for instance, in Greek, ancient Greek, um, which is what I know it from, those particles are absolutely common in formal, both poetic and prosaic uh, sources. So it is not at all seen as a part of spoken language that shouldn't be in your written language like there it's filled with them all that the ands and the ands and like in fact they're required they're to a certain degree if you're going to use a subjunctive or a optative you have to use the on particle or whatever so there's these various things that are absolutely not um discouraged whereas in english i think a lot of them are these days and I think that might be because Latin doesn't have that many of them, mm -hmm. of those kind of mm -hmm. ones, or at least written Latin. Goodness knows what there was in spoken language, Latin, but in written Latin, we don't have the same type of, types of particles that Greek does. Therefore, if we have it in English, it must be wrong, right? Is the old story of, of English grammar. Anyway, that's just not off the top of my head. I don't know anything but the formal study that. A lot of that, that work gets done by people working on pragmatics and discourse analysis yeah. Yeah. Um, because it is, you know, a lot more common to do that sort of thing in spoken language in English. Um, so, you know, that's where you do find those sorts of discussions. And certainly in Old English, um, there were what to my mind were, um, you know, a lot of, if you call them pleonasms, but um, like seeming overuse of, you know, little words that you don't, strictly speaking, need to have there for the meaning of, um, you know, the, 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 the strict, the sense, strict yeah. sense of, of, of the sentence. Um, but you find them used a lot in certain kinds of um, narrative texts. And so my theory is that they're, they're performing, um, uh, you know, discourse functions. Um, right. Yeah, they're pragmatic, yeah. And giving you, yeah, modal, like high, you know, foregrounding certain materials. 
certain certain parts of the of the you know the text of the of the uh, discourse um, mm -hmm. and you know doing those sorts of things. Well, I think maybe it's about time for us to wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, unless there's any last questions, I just want to say thank you to everybody for dropping by. We really appreciate it. We also appreciate your interest in the work and the videos in general. Again, we apologize for how long it's taken us to get out more of them. We are working on it. I promise um, it is a continued thing. And don't worry, the little ones are not stopping us from doing the long ones. Because I always feel like some people might be feeling that. Um, they are in, in parallel. Um, but we are working on stuff. Um, I don't think Mark is drawing out the current one so that he has more excuses to drink the cocktail that he's writing about, but it is a small possibility that that's what's going on. So I will make sure to keep it, keep an eye on him. Um, but we really do are very, very grateful for your interest and your presence here. And um, we hope to keep producing more material and nerding out about language and other related things. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you on the YouTubes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ivan. All right. Bye-bye. Bye for now. <laughs>